Not sure if the path of your parents is the path for you? What questions do you begin with? What does self-discovery feel like? My journey of self-discovery has been both my privilege and my tribulation. I have lived life differently than most. I offer educational sessions on how to pursue your path. Links and contacts are in the bios. Welcome to the Sex and Humans podcast. Hi with John David. As we begin to explore culture in a global setting, we begin to explore our relationships to ourselves, relationships to others. What I want to do with these new installments of podcasts is to start talking about my experiences with clients, my experiences with friends, and my own experience and my own journey on the ways in which we're beginning to understand how relating and relationships are changing. And that in and of itself is going to change how we interact globally in capitalism, in government, in policies that start to dictate what it is that we are in pursuit of as a society. Because our society is, whether we want to admit it yet or not, changing right now in a way that it hasn't changed in maybe three or 400 years. We're beginning to move into a different kind of reality. And that reality is being challenged by the powers that be or the current establishment. But that's okay. That's always happened and it will continue to happen. But progress is inevitable. As Martin Luther King said, the arc of history is long, but bends towards justice. And so I feel like we are moving in a more progressive, more honest, more equitable way between different nations and nationalities, between men and women, and even the understanding of what that actually is and why it's important that it really shouldn't be anybody else's business who you are if you're showing up in the world honestly with positive intentions. And anyone should be allowed to say, I don't relate to you and we're not going to hang out. That's okay too. But the old way of thinking is to suggest that if you don't fit into the standard culture, then you don't belong in the standard culture. And that standard culture doesn't have to make space for you. And this has been challenged time and time again, and we continue to make space for people. And every generation, I'm sure, as they've had to make space that may or may not have benefited them, specifically challenged whether or not those new people had a right to the space that the culture was providing for those already. So that brings me to a story. And in one of my client conversations, there was a story about the existence of future versus being present. And this experience said, I'm having a hard time being present in my life while at the same time acknowledging that I want my life to change. I want to be different in the future. I want to have a different reality in six months, in a year, in five years. Now, I would offer your willingness to commit to an idea for longer allows those ideas to be larger. It's much more difficult to make a huge, sweeping, dramatic change in your life in a week. It's much easier to make that kind of change in five years. So as we look to the future, trying to find this balanced idea, with the present. Postmodern culture continuously talks about work-life balance, relationship balance, equity in a relationship, friendship relationships, and everything that's a quid pro quo. But that's not always the presence of a relationship. Not all relationships are quid pro quo. A good relationship with a human being, I would argue, in the future is something to where I have the ability to give back to a relationship, give back to another human being without the expectation that they are going to return to me. Now, the quality of that relationship is going to change. In order to have a relationship with someone very, very close to you, the equality of that relationship, including the equity, probably needs to be more aligned. But very few people have space for more than three to five really close relationships, and that would include a partnered relationship 
if that's something that you're looking for, which again, I would argue, isn't really the goal or destination of this new global culture. It's not being eliminated from global culture, but the biological requirement to procreate is something that is going away, whether Elon Musk or Jordan Peterson want to acknowledge it or not. It is going away. And there is life choices being made that will have large, large impacts from individuals who choose not to do that, who choose to spend their life in service of others that aren't their children. There is going to be human beings that are having a great and grand impact on the world because specifically they have the time to do that because they don't have to divert all of their time and energy to their children. Now, what's happened in the last, say, 50 years is this idea that you could, quote unquote, have it all. And this kind of balance that people looked for has actually thrown the world way out of balance. And suddenly you have people trying to make huge impacts in their career or in their, their personal and adventure. And they are taking on challenging, challenging experiences to make a difference in the world at the cost of their children's experience, which is why I think you often kind of see the experience of really, really successful people having very, very struggling children. Now, that's not across the board. It's not a guarantee, but it happens more often than it should. It happens despite the fact that you would assume or think that a parent with great resources or someone with a large commitment to the social justice or a large ambition to help those around them would also be a great parent. Usually it comes at a cost at one of the two. And I think we're starting to recognize it. And my client was talking about their need to make a difference in their life's work, their life's purpose. They wanted to find something that made them feel special. And this is often have a child that will make you feel special. I would offer that having children really should be about giving the child purpose, not giving yourself purpose. But let's move away from that and assume that having kids, if it's something that you want, is a great and noble and beautiful thing. But it's also very, very self-sacrificing. But let's look at those that maybe aren't going to have children or haven't had children yet and are trying to decide if that's for them. When my father got married to my mother, he was in his late 20s. And my mother was in her early 20s. And she was in college. And when he proposed to her, she was a junior in college and was considering not going back because college was difficult. She was the first person in her entire family of, of any context to go to a, a college and, in fact, was also a woman in the late 70s. My father told her that if she didn't graduate, that he wasn't sure that they could get married because this was really important to him, despite the fact that at the moment, my father did not have a college degree. And in fact, many years would go by before he had a college degree. And they moved around the East Coast a little bit, up and down. They left their hometown and went to a, a northern state and came back. And finally, my father and my mother decided they wanted to have a family. And the way that my father was earning money at the time was by owning a liquor store. And my mother and father wanted something different other than just being the proprietor of a local liquor store. So my father decided to go to college late in life for that time period, late in life for this time period too. But back in the seventies, that was extremely late and putting together the finances and the time commitment, getting in all these different experiences were very new to my father as he didn't have a lot of guidance and or history in his family of people going to college either. And when he decided to go, he went to his mother and he said, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to go and get a degree. It's going to take about four years. Turns out he did it in about two and a half, but that's a different story of ambition. And his mother looked at him and said, John, do you have any idea how old you'll be when you finally graduate? As if to imply it wasn't worth the effort because he'll, he'll be so old when he graduates. That's not the way it's done. And my father's response was, I'll be the same age if I don't go. 
And that sentence is, is so applicable to today's world. It's so absolutely the answer to my client's question of how do you make your life better tomorrow by also being present in today's world? The ability to delay gratification at one point, but still have fun in the moment. He was still married. He was still enjoying Halloweens and birthdays and Christmases. He was still there, but he had made choices specifically that allowed him to have a better promise at the future. And so his choices started to bounce around one question. Does this help me graduate? Or does this not help me graduate? Does this decision in the present benefit this goal? Or does it take away? Or is it neutral? And the more you make choices that benefit the goal, and not only don't make choices that do not benefit the goal, but avoid even the choices that are neutral, the stronger your chances of actually accomplishing that goal will be. Now, the, the difference or the, the error in that philosophy is to focus so much on the goals that you're setting that you completely lose sight of the present. In my pursuit of getting into the U.S. Naval Academy, I remember this lesson. And I, as a young boy in high school, I made that mistake. Everything I did in high school was about getting into Annapolis, which I did do. But I missed out on a lot in my high school years. And you could offer that I've made up for it. I've had different experiences, but I was so myopically focused on this one singular goal and this one singular moment of success. And that at the time was getting into Annapolis. I hadn't really considered the challenges of what it meant to also graduate from Annapolis, but I was so focused on that. I missed so much of what should have been a, a really wonderful high school experience. I was on a sports team. I had the offering of friends, although I did not socialize at all. I avoided anything that I felt like could detract me away. And I had no ability to make a judgment about what was good for me and what was bad for me and what was neutral. I just knew that something inside of me needed to get accepted to the Naval Academy. And, and that's what I wanted to do. And I thought that was the right thing to do is to completely self-sacrifice the moment for the future. And as it turned out, I got all the things that I wanted or I had planned for getting in and graduating, in fact. But even then, I really struggled with the moment. I really had a difficult time being in the moment and enjoying the process. And thus, I was, I was depressed a lot throughout high school and throughout college. And throughout much of my young adult experience, I had not learned the balance of the two. I learned to delay gratification really well, but I didn't understand how to be present and focused. Postmodern philosophy teaches us how to be very present and amplifies the importance of that, but at a cost. So many of us today have lost sight of that ability to delay gratification and to be excited about the future and allow our decisions to guide us forward. So we get focused on the moment. We forget about what it's like to plan for the future. We forget about what it's like to have goals of large or lofty dreams. And I offer my father's advice of, or at least his excuse, which turned into advice for me of, I'll be the same age if I don't, allows us to say, this is what I want to do. And let your decisions and your choices bounce from this is helping to this is neutral. This is helping and this is neutral. Avoid things that take away from that experience. Just don't do it. And that's how you start to guide your life. And if you can make that distinction in what is this new understanding of balance that I just presented away from everything being about the present, and realizing that your work-life balance can also extend into this concept. If you're not happy with your job right now, if you're really struggling, like so many, especially millennials, who were taught 
this is the path. This is the ladder of life. And now that ladder is collapsing everywhere. And they're really, really disenchanted. And if this feels like you, listen, that ladder is going to collapse. There is no more future for the corporate growth, for the ability to say, I did my job here and I'm going to get promoted and to be a manager from a manager. I go from here, I go from here, and then I finish up my life and I die. That path is going away. Whether we are happy about that or not, it's irrelevant. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not is irrelevant. It is going away. There is a new ideas. There's new paths that are being generated for sure. But this, this guarantee path that our parents' generation, the boomers, and then the, the late Gen Xers, the ones that, that think they thought they figured it out. And to be honest, at the end of that era of this industrial age, they had. They really did figure it out. And they mapped it. And then they taught their children. And just as they taught their children, it ended. So what do we do now? What's the purpose? The purpose is to identify what makes you happy. And that is, that's, that's such a loud and obtuse word, happy. But that's the important aspect. Think about your life, where you've been content. Think about where you've been rewarded with dopamine, without drugs. And that's, that's another aspect of our society that is extremely prevalent. As we move away from you know, drugs that uh, numbed us out, we move towards drugs that enhance our experience, like psilocybin, THC, LSD, ayahuasca, DMT. These experiences that show us emphatically the world is bigger than we can perceive with our own five senses, that amount of dopamine can become addictive. And so I would encourage any kind of use of those medicines to treat them as such. These are not recreational drugs. These are drugs and medicines that help expand your mind so that you can start to really take some inner work, to understand who you are and where you want to go and start today. Because even if this process takes a lifetime, which I hope it does, you'll be the same age if you don't. And as a consequence, a, a lesson of this experience, my, my father died when I was 10 years old in 1989. He had barely begun his career as an investment banker after he graduated college before he got sick. And so when my father told my grandmother, I'll be the same age if I don't, that assumes that you make it to that age. But I promise you, his life was embittered from his decision to go to college. And the reason he went was to give me and my brother a better experience, a better chance in life, and better opportunities. And all of that was made true. So even though his personal experience ended shortly, the reason he made those choices was for someone else. And I would offer in this final monologue, that is the answer to whether or not this path is actually going to give you what you want. Is there an element of this path that is for someone else? If it's completely for you and only for you, it may be a valid and needed choice in your life, but it is not the last and the end all choice. That just isn't what it's for. There must be an aspect of your goals that make other people's lives better. So thank you so much for listening. This is the Sex and Humans podcast. My name is John David Whalen. Not sure if the path of your parents is the path for you? What questions do you begin with? What does self-discovery feel like? My journey of self-discovery has been both my privilege and my tribulation. I have lived life differently than most. I offer educational sessions on how to pursue your path. Links and contacts are in the bios. Thank you for listening to the Sex and Humans podcast. My name is John David Whalen, powered by Riverside FM.